Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for another HRDQU webinar. My name is Asia and I'm going to be your host today. We have a great presentation for you presented by Rick Lepsinger titled Flexible Leadership, How Forward-Looking Leaders Adapt and Can Create Value. Our goal for this webinar is to have you walking away with, a great, with great information on how becoming a flexible leader can be a game changer in your career endeavors. We do have a handout for you today. It is all the slides from the presentation. You can go ahead and download those now from the handout section in your dashboard. Also, we will have a questions and answers ses session at the end of the presentation. Feel free to ask your questions throughout the presentation or you can wait until the end. You can type them into the questions box on your dashboard as well. Our presenter, Rick, will answer as many of your questions as possible, but the questions that we can't get to will be answered after the webinar and sent to you in an email sometime next week. So while we're on the topic of leadership, it's important to know that Leadership is a lifelong endeavor you can never stop improving upon. There's no such thing as being too good of a leader. And the skills required can translate seamlessly from your professional career into your personal life. But studies have shown that 40% of new leaders fail within the first 18 months on the job. The good news is that leadership failure can be predicted and even prevented when managers are given the right resources. So a great resource to improve leadership skills is a product called Leadership Unlimited. It instructs how to understand the management skills needed to maintain and encourage success. It is an assessment on management development training for leaders and managers to help measure leadership behaviors and de develop an action plan to deliver effective leadership skills. So for the next two weeks, we are running a very special discount exclusively for today's webinar attendees only on this great product from HRDQ. Stay tuned until the end for a special promo code. All right, so now we can get started. Today, we have with us a very popular HRDQU presenter, Rick Lepsinger. He is the managing partner at On Point Consulting. His career focuses on helping organizations develop and, and identify leaders, as well as helping them work better virtually and enhancing their cross-functional team performance. He conducts numerous seminars and workshops on succession management, leading from a distance, leading cross-functional teams, and enhancing execution. Rick also has written numerous articles and is the author and co-author of several books. During the presentation, you will hear about Rick's book, Flexible Leadership. Stay tuned until the end to get a little bit more information about the book and where to purchase it after today's webinar. So welcome, Rick. We're happy to have you here with us today. Great. Thanks very much, Elsha. And everyone, thank you. Uh, it's great. I'm glad you could join us for today's session. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, leadership in general. And um, the key here is it's probably not surprising. You know, uh, we all know that there are leaders, you know, who are competent, who are capable, who are able to get things done. Uh, but the big question is really what sets them apart? What really makes a great leader? One of the things we know is that it's not just about personality, it's not just about their charisma in general. It has to do with, we find, with this whole notion of agility. And that's what we're gonna talk about today in terms of how leaders can be better in terms of adapting and be agile to be able to deal with all the challenges they face day to day. The, the, the big question really is, when it comes to leadership, is there anything really new to be said. Hasn't everything already been said about leadership? There are so many studies, there are so many books, there are so many models, there are so many uh, uh, um, taxonomies about leadership. What is there new? And actually, surprisingly, there is something new to say. And here's a little bit, as we took a look at what's out there right now, here's what we found. Uh, most of the research and most of the theory on leadership really focuses on one or two aspects of leadership. They tend to take a narrower view of leadership. For instance, you'll have you know, servant, leader, servant leaders uh, leading from the heart, uh, focus on execution, which is a very popular theme right now. But from our view, it tends to be actually quite narrow. The other thing is that all these models assume that this one list of behavior, this one style 
can be used in all situations. In other words, these are the leader behaviors and they apply across the board, which we think is not totally accurate, especially in such a dynamic world. Uh, in addition to that, most of these leadership taxonomies, these leadership models focus on uh, motivating individuals. They don't necessarily deal with influencing organizational performance directly or the financial performance of the organization. Um, in addition, when you look at these various models, uh, they provide guidelines uh, for leader behavior, uh, but they don't talk about how each of these behaviors interact with each other, how they relate to each other, or how they impact organizational processes and performance overall. And the flexible leader model actually addresses many of these challenges. The other thing is, you know, what's popular now is that you're reading books by, let's call them celebrity leaders or famous leaders in general. And you're really trying to get best practices from you know, what they do. In other words, it worked for them. I'm sure it'll work for me. And the concern about that is that it tends to be idiosyncratic. In other words, this is a particular leader in a particular situation that did particular things. And it may be difficult to generalize that to your situation or across situations. So what we're trying to do is provide leaders with guidance that talks about a range of behaviors, a range of competencies that can be appropriate in a number of various situations um, and that also address overall organizational performance. And that was really the backdrop for the development of the flexible leader model. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, we'll talk about the factors that impact organizational performance, and we'll focus on three key factors. And then we'll talk about this, the whole leadership challenge around being able to be flexible, but still maintaining balance. These three factors are all relevant and important for uh, high-performing organizations, but by nature, they are not necessarily compatible. Uh, matter of fact, effectiveness in one area can impact effectiveness in another. So the key for the leader is to be able to be agile and responsive, yet still maintain some kind of balance among these three factors. I'll provide you with some very specific tools uh, that'll help you enhance organizational effectiveness. And then we'll talk a little bit about the competencies that are required for flexible, agile leaders in general. So the three factors are efficiency, and process reliability, people, and adaptation. And the key here is to be able to understand when each of these is most important and be able to bring the appropriate leader behavior and the appropriate systems and processes to bear to be able to be effective in each one of these areas. The significant challenge is when more than one, maybe all three, are critical at the same time, and how do you maintain the balance across all three? And we'll talk a little bit about what some of those challenges and difficulties are. So let's start with efficiency and reliability. And starting with efficiency, this is all about maintaining high levels of productivity and quality overall. It's about effectively using resources in a way that minimizes cost but still maintains high levels of quality and or safety. Uh, and it's about producing and delivering products and services in a timely, efficient, and safe way. And that's kind of what we mean by efficiency and reliability overall. The, uh, the key here is that, and I think this is sort of a nice message, is that efficiency and reliability are kind of back in style. Uh, there was a time, a period, where the focus was all on innovation, on creativity, on broad strategic views, which is also important. But organizations, leaders <clears throat> are now starting to get um, a much better understanding on the critical role that efficiency and reliability plays uh, in general. And again, it's not just about charisma and vision. It's also about focusing on sort of the nuts and bolts of the organization. And our point is you really do need both. And later I'll talk a little bit about this, um, what I think is a false dichotomy between leadership and management. And it's not really one or the other, it's really 
being, you know, it's almost simultaneous being a leader and a manager, but it's also knowing when to be a leader and when to be a manager, not so much either or. So in terms of efficiency, when it's most important, and these are some of the characteristics, the whole notion of when the competitive strategy of the business is to be a low cost provider, when the industry experiences downward pressure on pricing, and when the business is unable to pass along increases in cost to the customer. Now, during today's presentation, I'm going to share uh, information like this about each of these key factors, when it's important, and some of the skills. And you're going to have a chance to basically assess your situation to see where you are as an Agile leader, or if you're responsible for developing leaders in your organization, what are the drivers for effectiveness in your organization? So let's take a look at the first uh, polling question. Uh, and here uh, we're going to ask you guys to be able to rate yourself um, in terms of the extent to which these factors are characteristic of your business, All right? So here's the polling question. If you take a moment to just identify, and you can pick as many as apply. If more than one apply, please select all that are relevant for you. And then please keep this in mind as we go through and you'll get a sense of what some of the challenges that are facing you and or your leaders in your organization. So when we get to 75% or so, we can close that poll and show the results. We're at 50% right now, so a little bit longer. Yeah, as if they're All coming right. slowly. I'm gonna go ahead. Yeah. Yep, I'm gonna go ahead. Okay, so let's see what we got. All right, so among this group, we have about 185 people or so on the call. And uh, it look, it's, re it's reasonably even. It looks like many of you on the call now are dealing with this uh, uh, the low-cost producer challenge. Uh, and again, that will be important to remember when we start to talk about people and adaptation. Uh, the downward pressure on price uh, for, for fewer and unable to pass along cost increases. So here the idea is to have the most efficient organization possible uh, to be able to deal with these challenges overall. Let's uh, take a look at the next slide. Uh, Right. So the, the next component of this is reliability. Uh, and again, it's part of the efficiency uh, segment, but this is where the quality of the product or service really depends on the processes that are used overall. And if there were any defects in terms of quality or the product overall, it could have serious consequences either for customers and or for the health and safety of the employees in general, or it could imply financial loss or damage to expensive equipment, could also result as well. So looking at this particular element here, this notion of reliability, let's do the same thing. Which of these characteristics are, are um, uh, which of these elements uh, characterize your business? And let's see what we've got here. And again, we'll stop it when we get in between 50 and 75% just to get a feel for the group. But even if you're not necessarily voting, just you know, mentally, just kind of think about your organization, think about what the drivers of effectiveness are for your organization. And this is one of them, and we'll take a look at the other two. Okay, Aja, why don't we close it down? All right. So on this one, it looks like it's a, it seems to be a, a clear uh, preference around uh, the quality of the products depends on the processes overall, uh, a little less on some of the others, but that seems to be the key driver where reliability becomes you know, essential and it's also based on your processes. So let's take a look at the next slide. 
Right. And here's an example uh, when we're talking about efficiency and reliability. This is one of the icons, one of the key examples. And generally speaking, when you think of efficiency and reliability, McDonald's might actually be a name that comes to mind. This is an organization that focused on food that's inexpensive, consistent quality, and delivered quickly. And again, whether you well, there are millions and millions of people who love the food. The idea here is they really have been built on a highly efficient and a highly reliable operation. What you're going to see a little bit later is some of the trouble McDonald's had as they tried to adapt and adopt and respond to some of the competitive threats from Burger King's, uh, from Burger King and from Wendy's as well. So let's take a look at the next organizational uh, factor, which is adaptation. And this is all about responding to internal, external threats and opportunities uh, in a way that maximizes performance. It's taking actions that increases sales, and it's finding ways to make sure that you've got the necessary materials and you've got the resources to get the work done. Adaptation is particularly important when you're operating in a, uh, an environment that's uncertain, that's turbulent, when the competitive strategy is all about unique, leading-edge products, you know, being the first with something, and when there's a strong uh, competition and there's little or no protected position. In other words, there's no barriers to entry. Anybody can get in there, right? Um, and that's where adaptation is critical, where everybody can stay ahead. So let's take a look and see for um, here. Oh, before we take a look at your situation, an, an important thing to remember is that the difference between innovation and adaptation, and frequently people use them as synonyms. And it, from our point of view, that's actually not the case. Innovation is a means to an end. Innovation is a critical process, but it's a, me, a me mechanism to enhance the ability to adapt, right? It's not an end in itself. And we're focused on sort of that end product where you have in fact made the adjustment to the new situation. So let's take a look at your uh, particular organization and which of the following characteristics, uh, uh, the following factors uh, characterize your business overall. And you can select as many as apply. And we'll see the extent to which these are characteristic as well as the reliability and efficiency characteristics. All right, let's see what we got. Ah, so again, here it's fairly evenly distributed uh, across all three factors. Now, hopefully you can also start to see the pattern that's emerging, because if in fact reliability, efficiency are critical to performance, and if you also have adaptation and you're operating in an environment where adaptation is also critical, you'll find that it's, it will be difficult to find a sweet spot for both of those areas. Because as you start to invest in new and different uh, processes and work, it'll have an impact on the efficiency and effectiveness of the organization. And that just starts to capture some of the challenges. And we'll talk a little bit more about that going forward. So let's see that next slide. So here's two examples, I think, of uh, uh, where uh, adaptation, uh, it's a good solid example of adaptation. Uh, Walmart, I think, has done a fantastic job on transitioning from uh, just bricks and mortar to kind of successfully uh, launching online marketing and a presence online overall. And in fact, they, find that they found a way to have the online presence and the brick and mortar presence sort of um, you know, uh, leverage each other and get the most out of each. They've done some collaborations with Google to respond to Amazon's purchase a Whole Foods. So it's a nice example of being able to adapt to changes in their uh, competitive environment. And uh, Walt Disney also has done a nice job where they used to have a, um, an agreement with Netflix to distribute product, but then they decided that it would be better for them 
to develop their own online distribution, not just content, but be able to uh, get the online distribution. And they eventually cut ties with Netflix when they started to um, both producing, when Netflix started to produce content, they basically stepped away and focused on distribution as well. So it was a nice, both examples are a nice example of what we mean by adaptation, of which innovation might have been a key element as well. So taking a look at the last, which is around people, this is around uh, ensuring people have the skill and expertise to uh, uh, effectively do their work, uh, making sure people are motivated, have high levels of commitment to the organization, and that among people and among teams, there are high levels of trust, respect uh, that are required to get the work done. So here's a, an interesting statistic related to investing in people. Uh, there was a study, University of Pennsylvania, took a look at 3,000 companies, and they found that a ten, uh, spending 10% of revenue on capital improvements boosted productivity, almost 4%. But a similar investment in human capital increased productivity by 8.5%. So again, here it just reinforces the value of people and the importance of people on the uh, effectiveness of the organization. But when is this notion of people and human resources most important? And again, we say people are always important and that's true, but it's really about why. What are the conditions that make that true? Well, when the work is complex, when it's difficult to learn, right, then you really want to focus on both retention, engagement, and high quality people. When it requires high levels of skill and motivation, when it requires a lot of cooperation and teamwork, and when it's difficult to recruit and train replacements. This is when the focus on retaining, uh, engaging, ensuring people have the skills becomes critical. So it's not just saying people are important, it's really directed toward the business reasons why. So let's take a look and see um, the extent to which, hold on, yep, there, there it is. Uh, in terms of which of the following uh, characterize your business. And again, you can check as many as are appropriate here. All right, again, we'll see the extent to which these are relevant to the performance of your organization, if these are things that your organization needs to deal with and respond to. And here, and here are the results. All right, so again, it's, uh, the, the, the two main ones are uh, high level of skill and uh, the, the success working in recess requ requires cooperation. And we're actually finding that this notion of cross-organizational cooperation is becoming more and more important. And more than half of you on the call are also uh, dealing with the difficulty of uh, recruiting and training uh, talent. That's becoming uh, much more difficult, especially as the economy improves. But in addition to that, many organizations are finding that the people with the skills they need just are not available, not just because of competition for those skills, but because people just sort of didn't attend to them and weren't developing those skills. Let's take a look at the next slide where we can talk a little bit about the challenge overall. And here's a couple of examples. Now, again, on this people side, Costco, those of you may be familiar with Costco, has done a great job in terms of being able to increase um, they have great benefits, great pay, much different than a lot of the other uh, um, competitors in this particular space, like Sam's Club and things like that. And they end up doing their productivity per square foot is significantly higher or certainly a leader in the industry overall. And then, of course, the National Basketball Association, basketball, uh, sorry, baseball uh, league, the, the challenge there is that you bring in young recruits. Uh, and you're trying to nurture that talent. But a lot of these young players, you know, they made for some of them, it's the first time they've been away from home. Uh, they may not, uh, they may get discouraged. Uh, they may get a little bit depressed. And the uh, baseball really has a whole infrastructure in place to mentor, to befriend, to keep these folks engaged, motivated, 
happy, focused, so they don't lose the talent early on. And that's what that whole farm system is all about overall. So what's the challenge here? You've taken a look at these three key organizational determinants, and for many of you, your particular business uh, is characterized by many of the challenges in all three of those areas. And the key here is to be able to focus on all three of these areas simultaneously, right? Not one at a time, but actually to address all of them simultaneously, knowing and focusing on which are most important, you know, based on the demands and the challenges, uh, but avoiding the clashes that occur. Because again, these three areas are uh, by definition mutually exclusive and finding a way for them to coexist can be very difficult, very challenging. So let's take a look at what, what these key um, trade-offs are. And there's three pairings. It's efficiency versus adaptation, efficiency versus people, and adaptation versus people overall. So let's take a look at the first one. And here you're trying to strike a balance just between efficiency, reliability, and adaptation. And the main net out is that major changes that are required for adaptation can have a significantly negative impact on current processes, on being able to get the work done, partially because people are distracted, partially because the investment in this change or this new area can uh, increase overall costs to the organization. Uh, too much focus on the other side of it, too much focus on the market change can divert attention from the efficiency side of things. People lose focus in general. Uh, and on the other side of it, if you emphasize the standard operating procedures and the efficiency side, it can reduce uh, organizational flexibility and make it more difficult for new approaches, new investment to sort of see the light of day overall. So being able to uh, deal with some of these trade-offs becomes difficult. And here's an example of an organization that had a little bit of a problem, and this is McDonald's. Again, they are the efficiency kings here, but when they tried to adapt their process, when they tried to change to be able to respond to the competitive threat from Wendy's, from Burger King, and they introduced the Have It Your Way campaign, which some of you may be familiar with, where you could basically make your own burger, order your own burger. It had a dramatic impact on their order fulfillment, and it basically slowed everything down, and it increased the wait time. So they, again, as, although they're a great example of the efficiency, reliability, consistency side, they had a little bit of difficulty being able to find the balance between adaptation, change, and still maintaining high levels of, of efficiency. And as you re recall, they abandoned the Have It Your Way campaign and focused on the nuts and bolts of what they believe they're good at. In addition, another example is Amazon, and this is on the other side of it. For, for some reason, Amazon is able to make significant investments in technology and invest in new businesses, but that has not impacted their ability to fulfill orders, to respond to customers in a timely way and in a high quality way. They really haven't lost a step regardless of all the change, all the innovation, and all the adjustments that they're making to continue to drive. As a matter of fact, a lot of their moves really create problems for other organizations. So when they're moving now into the grocery business, that's now gonna cause a lot of problems for uh, the grocery industry that really relies on efficiency. Groceries have such thin margins, it's all about efficiencies and reliability in general. The next one is around efficiency and people. So this is where, again, to uh, motivate, retain, engage, you want to have higher levels of compensation, uh, and that increases satisfaction and commitment, but it also increases cost, right, and can impact efficiency. When you have uh, rules, controls that improve reliability, it might uh, negatively impact employee satisfaction, commitment, because, again, they see it as lack of flexibility, lack of ability to 
um, uh, impact their environment because they're just sort of carrying out the rules and the procedures. And of course, when you do downsizing uh, or outsourcing in order to reduce cost and improve efficiency, uh, what also might happen is you might lose key skill knowledge areas and also negatively impact morale overall. So again, here's an example, although Walmart was seen as a good example. Here again, uh, Walmart got criticized for the way they were treating employees and responding to that, they invested you know, uh, um, over two and a half billion dollars in higher wages and more training for workers. The positive side was that there was lower turnover and it, it, it impacted the shopping experience, which made it much more uh, appealing for the customer. However, there was a significant decline in operating income <laughs> and it, it dropped, you know, almost, you know, almost a billion dollars. So again, trying to find that right balance can be challenging. The other example, and some of you may be very familiar with this, is sort of the U.S. Postal Service. Over, you know, the last decade, they've been reducing spending um, because they've had significant competitors uh, and they're trying to improve their efficiency so they can be more profitable. But that's had a serious negative impact on people overall. They've reduced labor costs by 10 million, but there's been significant uh, levels of job dissatisfaction among the employees. People just don't feel that their job's important. Uh, and there certainly hasn't been much of an investment in developing people overall, which will have, again, longer term impact on the organization. And the last sort of challenge here is around adaptation and people. And again, this is where focusing on change, new things can divert resources that might normally be used for compensation, for training, for development. Um, and by the way, you know, when, uh, when there are cost issues, many of you know that it's the human resource side of things that gets cut first. Uh, managing change, can leave uh, less time for the people-oriented kinds of behaviors because you're focused on the change side of things. Change can be very, very stressful. Um, and um, the uh, priority on protecting privileges may impede change. So that sort of goes the other way. So either change can be stressful for people or divert funds that might be used for people, or on the other side, focusing on protecting whatever benefits or privileges employees currently have may impede the ability to change overall. Let's take a look at two examples. One is Volkswagen, uh, and here they were making a shift to hybrid and electric cars from diesel, and among the management and the labor unions, this created significant stress and significant resistance because they were all built around the diesel, and now this shift they saw as threatening. So, but the need to shift became critical for the organization's success but they needed to find a way to sort of bring the people side with them and not just focus on the change side. Another example is Levi's. Now Levi's has been a great example of an organization that really attended to cust uh, employee uh, engagement, employee retention, employee loyalty, long before it became sort of a buzzword and the thing we talk about. They had profit sharing, a lot of quality, of work-life balance kinds of programs, and there was a culture of inclusion where they really did involve people in decision-making um, across the board, especially things that would affect them. The downside of all of that was that that culture of inclusion made it really difficult for them to be responsive. So uh, frequently there were new trends in clothing that the organization just had difficulty responding to in a timely way because they were basically looking for more of a consensus sort of a decision among leadership and employees. And it just was too difficult and too time consuming to make that happen. So it, the focus on people in this case impacted their ability to adapt uh, on a regular basis. So let's talk about the tools. And here we're gonna get to this notion of leader versus manager, but you guys are gonna have a chance to assess either your competence in key areas and or the competency of the leaders that you're responsible for developing. So let's take a look at efficiency, process reliability first. Um, 
the key here, and this is part of the problem, is that uh, execution, getting things done, the implementation side of things, just doesn't sound very exciting, right? Uh, generally speaking, this is the stuff that leaders delegate. When we think of implementation, when we think of execution, we don't think of leaders. We associate this with managers, right? It's all about managers. But in fact, that's not really the issue. Uh, it really is about finding that balance. And it's not whether it, this is what a leader does or what a manager does. It's really this is what needs to be done for the organization. So I think it's a false dichotomy to say that efficiency is the manager's job where change might be the leader's job. But taking a look at task-oriented behaviors, which are all focused on the efficiency side of things. So if the organization is focused on efficiency, these are some of the key behaviors and skills that need to be employed. Operational planning, clarifying roles and objectives, monitoring, and uh, problem solving and decision making. So let's take a look and thinking either about yourself, if you're a leader or if you're a HR professional that's responsible for training and development, which of the following skills uh, do leaders in your organization, would they benefit from enhancing? And again, you can check as many as you think would apply here. And let's, we'll see what we have in a couple of minutes. All right, let's see what we got. All right, well, clarifying roles and objectives seems to be the one that, uh, but again, and that also is very consistent with this notion of working effectively across organizational boundaries, which comes up uh, quite a bit and the idea of solving operational problems. So again, this is, the, this is really focused on ensuring efficiency for the organization and the skills that are necessary. But it's not just about leader behavior. And let's take a look at the next slide, please. It's not just about leader behavior. It also requires structure, systems, and programs to support the leader behavior. It's not just about an individual or a group of individuals who are demonstrating these key behaviors, although that is essential. It's all about making sure you've got the right programs in place, the right systems in place, because this is where you get behavior aligned. Rather than getting pockets of people around the organization that are uh, uh, demonstrating the appropriate behavior, it's the systems and programs that can help get sort of a critical mass and get people aligned. So on efficiency, it's around quality and process improvement, performance management and reward systems are all about that as well to reinforce the behavior and the sort of uh, SOP, standard operating procedures that guide behavior overall. The next side is adaptation. And again, this is the side where we associate with the leader. This is that forward thinking, change oriented side. But I'd suggest to you again that it's not just about the leader. This is about, let's call it leaders at all levels. Even the first line supervisor needs to be focused on and thinking about both when and how to adapt, but how to manage the challenge of balancing competing demands from the, from the various areas. So here we'll take a look at the behaviors. This is about monitoring the environment, building support for change, implementing change, encouraging innovation, and facilitating collective learning. Once again, associated with leadership, but really important for a leader, a manager, at any level of the organization. So let's take a look again to assess yourself and or to be able to uh, assess the leaders in your organization, which of the following skills would leaders in your organization benefit from enhancing to be able to better deal with these challenges? And let's see what we've got.
Okay. Uh, yeah, building support. Actually, uh, that's not unusual. And it's interesting. You know, we've been just for what it's worth. You know, for over like you know 20, 30 years, uh, we as a industry, uh, as a you know academics, consultants, uh, senior managers have been focused on uh, change and being able to uh, provide leaders with the skills they need to be able to uh, implement and uh, manage change better. And still a high percentage of changes fail. As a matter of fact, the statistic on the number of changes that fail hasn't, hasn't improved in 20 years. So this is really an area that needs attention. And I do think some of it has to do with this notion. It's not just about managing the change. It's also about uh, finding the balance and not letting other aspects of the organization deteriorate. Let's take a look at the next slide. So, uh, yeah, so this is the, uh, the, the uh, again, it's not just about leader behavior. It's also about the systems and programs that are in place to kind of get critical mass aligned. And here you can see a number of uh, programs that support adaptation, that make it more a part of the organizational DNA and not dependent on any one individual or group of individuals' behavior, but really starts to drive and reinforce this kind of uh, thinking related to uh, adaptation and responding to changes in the environment. The last area is the people side of things. And this is where that whole leader manager thing starts to fall apart. Because when you take a look at these behaviors, who gets these behaviors? Are these leader behaviors or are these manager behaviors? And it's really both. Everybody should be focused on this. So again, to really make that separation, it becomes distracting and really um, you know, diverting. It's really not so much either or, it's all about when. When do I need to focus on the leader side in terms of focusing on adaptation and change? When might I focus on the um, manager side, focusing on efficiency and reliability? And sometimes I have to do both those things simultaneously while I'm also attending to the people. And that's the challenge for leaders overall, to find that balance. So again, for you guys, let's take a look. Which of the following skills would your leaders, uh, the leaders in your organization or you, benefit from enhancing? And check all that apply. Okay, let's see what we got. Oh, there you go. Uh, on the developing side, that seems to have an edge on a lot of them. And again, that goes back to developing uh, related to performance management. It could also be related to bench strength, ensuring that people uh, have, uh, you have uh, people in position to fill uh, other roles going forward, right? Uh, and empowering, right? It's all about delegating and ensuring people are able to uh, perform at a high level. Great. Let's take a look at the next slide. So once again, uh, it's the system side of things to support that effort. Human resource planning systems, employee development programs, recognition and reward programs are all kind of tools that the leader can call on to augment and really uh, support the use of those key behaviors. It's not just about leader behavior alone. So let's take a few minutes to talk about 10 competencies for flexible leaders, and then we'll be able to take a little bit of time for questions in general. So the first has to do with situational awareness, and this is really understanding how external, internal events are relevant uh, and, uh, and impact the effectiveness of the leader and the organization. It's to be able to uh, be more situationally aware, uh, to be able to get beneath the surface uh, uh, and to learn about like prior events, the power relationships in the organization, interpersonal relationships, informal processes, the whole hidden agenda thing, um, and the attitudes and feelings of those, of those involved. There's a big part of this that's sort of putting things in context, but there's also a significant component of emotional intelligence here 
to get a sense of the whole dynamic. And then related to that is system thinking. And this is this notion of complex problems usually have multiple causes. And in large systems like organizations, uh, you need to uh, think about uh, the actions can have multiple outcomes and can uh, not just uh, impact the area that you're looking at or focused on, but can ripple through the organization in general. The focusing on what's important is all about having a leadership agenda. Uh, so based on uh, sort of your uh, long-term view, the overall objectives and priorities for the organization, you've kind of got this agenda that'll help you sort through all the information that's coming at you. How do you know what's important, what's not important? How do you filter through the information? And having that kind of leadership agenda focused on short, mid, long-term objectives is one of the ways you can make that happen. Of course, self-awareness is key. It's the other component of the emotional intelligence side of thing, understanding your own emotions, your own motives, and the impact that that has on decision-making and it has on other people uh, can definitely um, uh, help you be more effective, help you deal with some of the stresses, help you maintain enthusiasm and a positive view that becomes critical for leader effectiveness. The personal integrity, I think most people would agree, that without integrity, uh, it's unlikely that a leader will be able to retain the trust, the loyalty, and the support of people uh, whose cooperation you need in general. And it really is about keeping promises, keeping commitments, um, uh, being consistent with your organizational values, taking responsibility. Um, and again, it really, uh, it has uh, studies demonstrate that integrity, high levels of trust really are drivers for leader effectiveness. This idea of building a core ideology, uh, and here you're trying to have uh, a, a shared picture of the overall purpose of the organization and how the organization's members fit into that purpose and how they'll be treated overall. And this is really sort of the construct within which you can help people understand why some of the trade-offs are being made and how the trade-offs are consistent with the organization overall. It's a way to gain support and commitment to, to those outcomes. Being able to build um, capable leaders at all levels, it's again, it's having a strong bench, it's having people in place with the skills to perform, because again, if the leader demonstrates the behavior, that's great, but you've got to have people at all levels of the organization equally competent overall. And you need to have a bench uh, to be able to fill key positions when they open. The idea of involving and empowering people at all levels is a way to build commitment, build, uh, also improve the quality of ideas, improve people's buy-in and engagement to the ideas that are uh, eventually implemented. Keeping lines of communication open is around making sure that you're accessible. And it's not just about connecting with people, it's also about learning, understanding what's going on in the organization and what's driving it. And of course, the modeling leader behavior and being able to um, uh, demonstrate what your expectations are for other people in the organization through your own behavior the consistency of that behavior uh, and sort of the walking the talk of that behavior as well. So a couple of kind of general summary points and then we can take a few questions. Uh, this notion of organizational effectiveness is really very complex and a lot of the models that are out now oversimplify what it takes to be an effective leader and it really does just focus on you know, dealing with people, which is a very important component, but not sufficient overall. And it's all about balancing these competing demands and trade-offs, both knowing what's important, but also finding a way for these mutually exclusive elements of organizational effectiveness to coexist simultaneously. It's also important that sometimes your go-to behavior the thing that you're most comfortable with, the thing that you do most of the time, may not serve you well in all situations. 
And the idea here, and this is where that flexible agility piece comes, to be able to move between the task, the change, and the people-oriented behaviors, and again, sometimes even simultaneously, but not just focusing on your personal preference and style, but being able to understand what's important here and to bring that best practice and that behavior to that situation. I've mentioned a couple of times that it's not just about individual leader behavior. It's important and you want your leaders to be competent and strong and be able to demonstrate the behaviors we've talked about. And without the supporting systems, without the programs in place, what you'll get more likely are pockets of individuals around the organization that are doing what they need to do. But if you're ever going to get critical mass and get a large organization aligned, you need systems, programs, processes to kind of get that mass overall aligned. My point on leaders and managers, even if you stay with that, that verbiage around leaders and or managers, and even if you think there are differences in leaders and differences in managers, the key is that if you're a leader, you need to be a good manager. It's not like you dump that off on somebody else. And if you're a manager, you've also got to be a good leader. You can't rely on someone else. So the separation, as I said, is a little bit uh, um, kind of uh, diverting and a little bit creates misunderstandings about what it means to be effective. It's finding ways for leading and managing to coexist and to be able to bring the best of both elements to the situation. The good news here is that leadership can be learned, right? It's not inherent. You're not a born leader, although there may be some people who are born leaders. But even if you're not, you can learn the behaviors that effective leaders use to deal with these organizational challenges. You can put in place the systems that need to be in place to be able to ensure consistent behavior down through the organization and focus people on the outcomes that are desired, right? So the good news here is that people can learn and hopefully we've been able to lay out what some of those key behaviors are and the construct for thinking about when each is most important. So the, the idea here is that, uh, again, it's really, it's, it's not so much, um, it's more about you as an individual and your ability to change and adapt, you know, whether it's a strategy you're pursuing or a technology that you're pursuing, all of that's going to change. And you're going to be dealing with this change overall. But your overall ideology, your ability to be flexible and to adapt, that's going to be the determinant of success overall. It's not the breakthrough technology. It's not the killer strategy. It's not the new product. It's the leader's ability to adapt, to be flexible, to read the situation, and to bring what's necessary for success to that situation. So everyone, thank you very much. Uh, we have some time for some questions. Um, Aja, if there are any, I'd be happy to take a few. Sure. Um, so we're going to go ahead and step into our Q&A session. While we are waiting for some of the questions to come through, I'm going to go ahead and discuss some of those promo items that we have that I discussed in the beginning of the of the webinar. So if you want to learn more about flexible leadership, check out Rick's book, Flexible Leadership, Creating Value by Balancing Multiple Challenges and Choices. This is available at hrdq.com and it is also also on the on the website we have a book bundle of four books that Rick has written and co-authored and that is also available for a discount price. So go ahead and check that out. And then that awesome product that we talked about from HRDQ, the Leadership Unlimited, is now 25% off for all of our webinar attendees. So this promo is going to last for only two weeks. So it was $184, but for you, it is $138. So it is a steal. The coupon code is located is listed right there on the screen. However, we also have it in the promo handout listed in your handout section right now. So if you don't want to write all this down, you don't want to download the handouts, we're going to go ahead and send these in an email next week as well. Um, so you have no chance of missing out on this opportunity. 
So, all right, Rick, let's move on to questions. Let's see, I do have a question from Linda. Which competencies of those listed are most critical? Right, and uh, actually that's a great question. And it really is kind of the whole point here is that it's all it's situationally determined. And that's, again, the problem with a lot of current models out there is that they focus on one set. It's either about people, about change, about execution. Uh, but what we're saying here is that all of these can be equally important depending on the situation. But I would also suggest to you that for many organizations now, it's a much more complex world. You know, maybe looking back, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you could say we're about adaptation. That's our key strategy. And we're, or we're focused on efficiency and being the low cost provider. That's our key strategy. I would suggest that now the strategies are much more complex. And even if you are trying to be the leading edge and the innovator, you still need to be able to deliver uh, whatever the product service is to people. So the idea here is to be able to bring to bear all three sets of behaviors. And one might not necessarily be more important. Now, having said that, if there is a particular driver, for instance, if the people side really is the core central component of your business, then you might say we need to really focus on that without losing sight of the others. If the efficiency side, let's say with McDonald's, you know, they went back and focused on efficiency because they said this is the core of our business and they went back and focused on that and they, they sort of didn't give the adaptation as much attention feeling that if we stick with what we know, we're going to keep customers and win new customers. So um, again, I would say, um, generally speaking, they're pretty equal, although you could make a case for there might be a little emphasis on one or the other. Great. Um, Chris asked, where do managers fit into the flexible leadership model? Yeah, I, I spoke a little bit uh, about that at the end. Uh, and again, here, we generally would associate um, uh, management with the efficiency process reliability side, but I'd be suggesting to you that it really is about, uh, it's kind of leader slash manager, and it's really about uh, knowing when to lead, when to manage, or you find yourself frequently, I think, being leader and manager simultaneously. Because even when you're, um, let's say you're uh, solving an operational uh, problem, which might be under the task side or the manager side, you might still need to be inspiring, engaging, motivating uh, people and individuals, which could be either leader manager or focusing them on the chain side of things. So again, I don't think it's either the manager or the leader, but how do you combine both those characteristics into each individual so they can be most effective? And I think that's a lot of what the flexible leader model is about. Great. Okay, we have time for probably one more question. Which of the three factors that affect organizational performance will be most important in the future? That came from Bethany. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a. Uh, if I could really answer that question and and look in the crystal ball, I think that would be uh, I'd be a real winner. I'd be able to really uh, you know you know direct my business to that. Looking back again, there was a time where. You could focus on any one. In other words, people were really important. Let me just focus on them. And this adaptation efficiency thing became less central. And there was a time where you could just focus on efficiency and not worry that much about adaptation. But I do think that the world has changed dramatically. And it's very seldom a nice, clean kind of look where, I mean, even some of the, let's call them heavy industry, key manufacturing groups, still need to focus on adaptation. It's not just about efficiency, process reliability, and safety. They also need to focus on people and they need to focus on the adaptation side. So I think going forward, all three of these things, um, these elements will be very relevant to organizational performance. And once again, the challenge will be to how to have them coexist. Because you saw in a few of the examples with uh, McDonald's and some of the others that uh, it was um, uh, difficult to find a way for these three components to coexist in a productive way. And that's really the focus and the challenge for leaders in the future. 
Great. All right. Well, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you, Rick, and a big thanks to everyone who joined us today. We appreciate your time. Be sure to sign up for our next webinar coming up next Wednesday, December 13th with Patty Phillips, and she's going to discuss with us how to measure the results of your training. So it's going to be another great conversation. Have a wonderful day, and we will all see you next week. Bye, guys. Thanks, everyone.